Welcome to Gateway Church. We're so glad you've chosen to join us today, whether you're watching online or here in person. Stand to your feet. Turn your heart to the Lord. We have an incredible worship service ahead. Hey, I want to make sure you guys know we have a guest worship leader with us today. Mr. Ryan Edgar is here. Welcome, Ryan. Ryan been a long time part of Gateway Church years ago. He and his wife been out in California. He writes and leads worship song. They were a finalist on America's Got Talent, but they're here to lead us and he's here to lead us in worship today. But listen, I want you to turn your eyes, literally turn your eyes to heaven right now, because as we turn our attention and our gaze to the Lord, let our hearts be filled with praise. Come on, begin to lift praise up to the Lord right now. Tell him, thank you, Lord. You just begin to worship him even now. Prepare your heart. Let's worship the Lord together. Something here to break So nothing needs 
God, we thank you, Jesus, that our victory is found in you today. And God, you're faithful. God, thank you that you see us right where we are. So we offer ourselves to you one more time. We bring every part of our lives before you today. We love you and thank you, God.
Come on, I don't, I don't think we can be done praising his name. Come on, give him praise again. That was, thank you, Lord, for meeting us. Thank you, Lord, for meeting us in this time of worship. You know, that second song we sang, we said, let's say the name that shifts the atmosphere. You might need the atmosphere shifted in your life. Maybe you're watching at home and you're going, yes, I need the atmosphere shifted in my life. Just begin to say Jesus. Close your eyes just for a moment. You begin to turn your attention, your, your spiritual eyes turn to Jesus and just say his name. Say Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you shift the atmosphere of our lives. Say Jesus. Jesus, we give you all honor and glory and praise. All honor to you, Jesus. Just say his name. Jesus. God, our focus, our attention turns to you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, I was, I was praying for this service, and I was doing it as I was riding my bike, and I like to go cycling outdoors, and there's one thing that is certain when you're cycling is the wind is relentless, is a relentless foe, doesn't ever stop. And I was thinking how similar that is to the enemy. The enemy comes and wants to fight at you all day long. Now, what I'm about to say isn't necessarily true when I'm cycling, but it's true in the Spirit. And that's 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that's in you that's in the world. Now, now listen, you might feel in the natural, because I feel this sometimes on the bike. I can't beat that wind, but here's what I know in the Spirit. Greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. The wind of the enemy that's coming against your life, the power of the Spirit present at work in you is greater than any force coming against you. Can you say thank you to Jesus for that? Say thank you, Lord. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Just keep your attention turned towards heaven right now. Let's just pray for God to meet us now. God, I thank you that you are here. As we worship you and praise your holy name, God, I thank you that you come and you meet us. So fall on us, Lord. I thank you for meeting us in this time of worship. Now open our hearts to receive the word. God, I pray that you would meet every need. Lord, even draw out needs that we're not even aware of. God, meet us today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said together, amen. 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 Come on. Give praise again. As you're doing that, praise the Lord. Turn around. Give someone a high five. Tell them you're glad to see them. Welcome to Gateway Church. Gateway family, aren't you thankful for God's love and faithfulness in our lives? Here are a few things you need to know. There are many ways you can connect with our Gateway community. Gateway groups are back in session and meeting in person or online. You can also follow us on social media. Join your campus Facebook group, visit gatewaypeople.com slash connect, or text connect to 71010. We're always posting encouraging content, and we also have online classes, ways you can help others, worship videos, and other information available. We're so excited to share that in-person kids ministry is back at our campus. Be sure to visit gatewaypeople.com slash kids to register and find out what we're doing to make sure your kids have an amazing and safe time. We also want you to know that we still have powerful worship, engaging video lessons, and fun games available online for kids birth through sixth grade at gatewaypeople.com slash kids. We also have tons of fun opportunities for seventh through 12th graders to connect and grow in their relationships with Jesus. Visit gatewaypeople.com slash students to find out all we have going on throughout the week. If you're on site at a campus, you can give today at one of our offering boxes. And regardless of where you are, you can always give online at gatewaypeople.com slash giving or through our mobile app. We also want you to know that if you need prayer for any reason right now, text prayer to 71010. We have prayer teams from every campus ready and waiting to pray. A lot of great things are happening at Gateway. To check out all that's going on, visit gatewaypeople.com. No matter where we gather, online or in person, here or there, we're Gateway together. Thanks for joining us today. Throughout the Bible, the number seven appears repeatedly to signify completeness or perfection. From the seven days of creation to the seven colors of the rainbow, it's no wonder that God heralded the entry of His Son into the world with seven unique prophetic words that still speak to us today. These are the words the King of heaven and earth used to usher in the greatest gift ever given, His Son. 
rewards are gifts he wants to give each one of us as we celebrate the birth of Jesus. The Seven Words of Christmas is sure to be a blessing enjoyed by the whole family. Every Christmas at Gateway Church, we take a special moment together to celebrate the light of the world, a light that can never be extinguished. And as always, we want to share it with you. During our Christmas candlelight services, we'll sing carols together, hear a timely Christmas greeting from Pastor Robert Morris, and experience the classic candlelighting moment. We'll also enjoy special musical performances from Rebecca Hart, Michael Bethany, The Voice Season 9 winner Jordan Smith, Grammy award-winning vocal group Take Six, and more. Whether you join us online or in person, this special event is sure to be a holiday favorite and brighten your Christmas season. For service times and locations, visit gatewaychristmas.com. Hey everyone, good to see you. Well, just to remind you, uh, next weekend, is our candlelight service, or services, I should say, all of our campuses and online. And let me tell you something that we did, because many people have not come back to own to church yet in person because of COVID, and I understand that completely. Uh, But what we did for next weekend is we've added more services. So if you'd like to come and, you know, wear a mask, remain socially distanced, all the things to be safe, we want us to all be safe, but we've got more services, and they are different times at every campus because we added a lot on Saturday. So it's not going to be the same time next week. So I'm I'm trying to give you forewarning to go online, find a service time, and if you'd like to attend, then next weekend our special candlelight services also at home. Um, I, I would just suggest you get a candle and a couple of candles, whatever, have your family over, however you want to do it. But we really want to celebrate next weekend the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's next weekend, all right? This weekend, normally, we have our Christmas production. We did not have it this year because of COVID. We're still praying for everyone affected by that and praying for a a healing from God, a cure. Uh, But I was thinking a few months ago, I'd like to do something special. And I couldn't think of anyone more special to bring in than this man, Uh, In 1985, he wrote his first book. Uh, Now, 35 years later, 120 million books in 57, uh, books sold uh, in 57 languages. Not just the best-selling Christian author of our time, one of the best-selling authors of our generation, and a man that loves the Lord, has walked with the Lord, integrity, a pastor, Uh, I know you've probably read one or five or ten of his books, so will you please, even at home, give a great big welcome to Max Lucado. Well, good evening. Hello, everybody. I love this church. I love this church. I love your pastor. I don't know if I've ever met anyone quite like him. I really don't. I mean, he just, yeah, do it. Just such a a man of vision and, and generosity. And every time I'm with him, I feel like I'm a better person. It just, something rubs off on me, and I feel the same way about this spectacular church, the extraordinary impact that you're having all over the world, and I I think that is just breathtaking. I've been a pastor since 1979. I know I don't look that old, but I have, I have. I know how challenging this work can be, and to see what you do and have done, it's just I hope you know that I love you, I admire you, I I applaud you, 
I aspire to be like you. And I, I'm just so tremendously, tremendously honored to be here in person, to be speaking to you online or at a different campus. It's a, it's a beyond blessing to me. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello from, yeah, thank you. Um, I bring you greetings from San Antonio, Texas. I'm still down there, right down I, I what is that, I-35? Yeah, just right down the road. Uh, still trying to uh, awaken our spurs a little bit. We're having a hard time right now, but, uh, but what a year it has been. When did the craziness of this pandemic disrupt you? Was it that first time in the grocery store line that you were told to stand six feet back on that strip of tape from the patron in front of you? Was it that moment last spring when you saw the news reports coming out of New York City in which the number of deaths were so high? I can still in my mind see that refrigerator, refrigerated truck parked outside the hospital. Was it the very first time you put on one of these Where's mine? I'm ready to burn them. I'm ready to burn them. I'm so tired of them. I'm so tired of them. I tell you, I will light the match. I'll pour gasoline on the stack of them. I'm ready to see them down. I am really tired of them. Aren't you? I'm tired of walking through, and I get it. I'm not anti-mask. That's not it. I just don't like what it does to us. I don't like not seeing smiles. I don't like not seeing expressions. I, we weren't, we just weren't made to, we, we weren't made to do this. Oh my. Maybe it, for you was that time that you visited grandma in the nursing home and had to do so through the window. Maybe it's the numbers. What is it, over 280,000 dead now, 290? How many people have been affected by their uh, employment situation? Over 33 million people negatively impacted by their work. Maybe, maybe for you it was, it was the protests or the riots or the, or the lootings last summer. But 2020 just feels like a bad dream. I mean like a bad dream. What do you mean no graduation service? What do you mean no fans in the stands? Is this a Dolly painting? Is this a science fiction movie? It's been a year like none other. One thing's for certain. We need some Christmas this Christmas. Amen? We need to hear the story. We need to hear the story about the angels singing. We need to hear the story about the baby in the manger. We need to know about the day God came, and we need to lift our eyes up and look at the day God's coming again. We need some Christmas this Christmas. And so if you need some Christmas this Christmas, you're in the right place. You're in the right place. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord, for the promise of Christmas. May you have mercy, please, upon our speaker. You know his sins are many. And help us to see Christ, just Christ. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Tis the season to be looking. Looking for snow if it's warm. Looking for mistletoe if he is dense. <laughs> looking for instructions if some assembly is required. Tis the season to be looking. Looking for red nose lights if you're young, for headlights if you're grandma, for insights if you're a pastor. <laughs> Tis the season to be looking. The first Christmas was marked by lookers as well. Joseph looked for lodging. Mary looked into the prunish face of Jesus. A thousand angels looked down upon the just born king. But no one was looking with the intensity of a seasoned saint. 
by the name of Simeon. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Unlike Joseph and Mary, Simeon did not witness the birth of Jesus. Unlike the wise men, he did not visit the child in Bethlehem. By the time he saw Jesus, the swaddling clothes had been packed away and the manger held only hay. Joseph and Mary had caught up on their sleep and the shepherds were back to tending their sheep. Forty days had passed. We know this for certainty because of the Jewish law. According to the Torah, the mother became ceremonially unclean upon the birth of the child. On the eighth day, the baby was circumcised, and then after an additional 33 days, a sacrifice would be made. In this case, the sacrifice was made in Jerusalem, in the temple. It was a baby dedication of sorts. And it was at this dedication that Simeon saw Jesus. Simeon, at least in my imagination, was an old man at this point. I see silver hair. I see etched face wrinkled, shoulders a bit stooped, step a bit slow, but eyes ever looking full of hope and light because he was looking forward. He was looking to the day when, according to another translation, God would take away Israel's sorrow, a day in which God would end the alienation of the people and reconcile himself to them. Now, Simeon knew this day would come in his day. The Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen him, God's anointed king. How did the Holy Spirit reveal this? I don't know. Did he tell him in a dream, in a vision, through the teachings of Scripture, through a prophetic word? I'm not sure. But he knew that Simeon knew that he would not die until he saw the coming of the king. And it changed the way he lived. Many, many years ago, back in my early days of preaching in San Antonio, I preached a sermon called Perhaps Today. I printed Perhaps Today, those two words on the Sunday bulletin back when we handed them out. I would have never remembered that sermon except just a couple of years ago, I was in the home of a seasoned saint of our church. She's been a part of the congregation all these many, many years, and I went to visit her. And there hanging on the wall was that Sunday bulletin framed right by her doorway. So every day when she walks outside, her thoughts are, perhaps today. Simeon lived with this perhaps today mentality. He could always be seen looking into the sky or looking into faces. He knew that Christ would come in his day and he was looking for that day. Maybe he would have enjoyed a perhaps today. Today, bulletin to hang on his wall. On the 40th day after Jesus' birth, that day arrived. Simeon was led by the Spirit to the temple. Are you noticing how the Holy Spirit is so active in the promptings and leadings of the life of Simeon? The Spirit led him into the temple. Maybe that day he had other plans. Maybe that was the day he was going to, I don't know, walk the dog or or, or, or take care of the garden, or maybe visit the grandkids. But then came this nudging, this prompting, this voice, this leading. And he said, I'm going to the temple. And he wound his way through the narrow streets and over the cobblestone paths, and finally he entered the temple courts. And though no doubt Simeon had ascended those steps hundreds, hundreds of times, maybe a thousand times in his lifetime, each time was more impressive than the first, the sight of Herod's masterpiece, those massive stones, the gilded roof, the great colonnades, 
Even on non-holidays, the streets were full of worshipers and, and pilgrims. And somewhere, in spite of the multitude, somewhere in the midst of the multitude, Simeon saw them, Joseph and Mary. No one else had reason to notice this young couple. Angels weren't casting rose petals on their path. Trumpets weren't blasting. Jesus did not arrive riding on a pillow or in a chariot. He had no halo. He had no aura. He had no glow about him. He gurgled. He slit, slept. He nursed. He was a baby. No one would have noticed. Besides, no one had any reason to notice this young couple from Nazareth. People came to the temple for one reason, and that was to encounter God. Who would have imagined that God was right there in the arms of that young girl? No one would have imagined except Simeon. And he saw the couple. And he whispered to himself, perhaps today. And he walked briskly across the temple courtyard through the crowd. He excused his way past the pilgrims and he caught up with Joseph and he tapped him on the shoulder and he said, excuse me. And the Nazarene couple stopped and turned. A year ago, Joseph might have taken offense at this interruption, this stranger. But boy, the last few months have taught him to pay attention to interruptions. Angels have spoken. Wise men have appeared with gifts. Shepherds have appeared. Surprise after surprise. His wife knew childbirth before she knew his bed. Joseph was learning to Expect the unexpected, so he tilted his head and he waited on, on Simeon to speak, and Simeon did. May I? And Joseph nodded at Mary, and Mary placed Jesus in the hands of Simeon. And he took the baby in his arms and thanked God. Now, Lord, you can let me, your servant, die in peace. With my own eyes, I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before all people. Simeon's response has come to be known as Nunc Dimittis. Now, dismiss. Now, that's a timeline term. Now, that's the word we use to signify a flipping of a calendar or the turning of a moment or the changing of an event. Now it's time for dinner. Now it's time to get up. Now it's time to move forward. Now, Lord, it is time to move into a new era, a new dispensation, a new reckoning, a new season. Now, Lord, the consolation of Israel had begun. The door of history had swung on the hinge of a Bethlehem gate. The author of life had turned the page and was preparing to write a new chapter. The pen was on the page. Simeon had no way of knowing the name of the chapter, but we do. We do. Scripture denotes this chapter, this period, as the last days. Paul said, in the last days, there will be many troubles. Peter urged us to understand what will happen in the last days. The author of Hebrews wrote, but now in these last days, God has spoken to us through his son. What began in that moment was the inauguration of the last days days. Friends, we are in the last days. These are the last days. 
The history of the world is not, as some have suggested, a repeating cycle, an endless circle of incarnation and reincarnation, but rather it is a direct arrow, a timeline that is full of now moments. Simeon got this. Do you get this? We are in the last days. Perhaps you read about the flight to nowhere. Qantas Airlines said it is their fastest selling ticket in history. The flight to nowhere sold out in 10 minutes. The cheap seats were priced at 575 bucks. The first class seats were sold for 2675 bucks. And what does a person get for the money? Seven hours of circling over Australia landing in the same place you began. Chalk it up to COVID-19. People are so tired of being stuck at home. People are so weary of going nowhere that they're willing to spend hundreds of dollars to go nowhere. Forgive my bluntness, but I'm keeping my money in my pocket and my feet on the ground. Pay money to fly in circles? No, thank you. Fly in a direction? That's better. Fly in a direction? That's biblical. Embedded in the core of Scripture, ladies and gentlemen, is this promise that we are going to end up in a better place than we begin. That we are headed in a new season, in a new direction, and that we live between the advents the first coming has happened. The second coming is on the schedule. We are in the last days. Christmas invites us to look back at the first coming, but it entices us. It dares us. It whispers in our hearts and says, oh, he's going to do it again. He's going to do it again. He who came once will come again. As he came once, he will come, but not as he came will he come. He will come in a different way. And so it is a good question to tantalize and to activate the Simeon spirit within us that perhaps today hope to ponder this time of year, not just what Christ did, but also to remember what Christ will do. He promised us, I will come again. The author of Hebrews declared Christ will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are what? Eagerly, eagerly waiting on him. History's next big event, best I can tell, is going to be like something that it's a sudden disappearance of all of God's people, an instantaneous rapture of God's family into his presence. He was surprising and unprecedented the first time he came. Oh, you're not going to believe the unprecedented way he comes the second time. The apostle says the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord forever. And so we will be with the Lord forever. At any point, perhaps today, Christians will, upon the signal of Christ, be transported into the presence of Christ. This rapture includes the resurrection of dead believers and the transformation of living believers. And it will occur in a moment, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That word moment is A-T-O-M-O-S in Greek, from which we get the word atom, atom, to the degree that an atom is small, that moment will be quick. It will happen without warning in the twinkling of an eye. Can you Twinkle just for a sec. That didn't take long. 
That didn't take long at all. That's how long God needs through Jesus Christ to rapture his church into his presence. Now consider the implications of this rapture. Churches will close. Christian schools will shut down. Every faith-based NGO will be discontinued. Christian doctors, lawyers, researchers, professors, all gone in an instant. The salt and light of society will be sucked off the planet, vanished. The stage will be set for the master of deception, the Antichrist, to work his evil. And like Adolf Hitler, he will emerge onto the scene in a time of such political and economic chaos that people will be willing to drink his Kool-Aid. They will look for anybody to explain what is happening and he will come with such flowing oratory and such satanic inspired miraculous abilities that he will conjure up some odd explanation and people will believe the Antichrist and he will inaugurate his era with the season of diplomacy. The Old Testament prophet said that leader will make a firm agreement with many people for seven years. He's going to hand out an olive branch. He'll enter into a seven-year treaty with the nation of Israel. And he'll be described as a great peacemaker. Yet midway through that treaty, he's going to break his promise and literally all hell will break loose. The prophet said he will cause astounding devastation and he will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper and he will consider himself superior. Chapters 4 through 19 of the book of Revelation describe in detail what will happen during the oppression of the Antichrist. These scriptures refer to famine and death and cosmic disturbances. J. Dwight Pentecost was right when he wrote, no passage can be found to alleviate to any degree whatsoever the severity of this time that shall come upon the earth. The tribulation shall be the darkest hour in human history. Combine the putrid spirits of Stalin, Hitler, Mao Zedong, Idi Amin with every arrogant ruler in the history of the world and you have the Antichrist on his nice days. Max, gee, thanks for this Christmas message that you're bringing. (laughs) My goodness, how you placed me in the Christmas spirit. (laughs) I know, I know. What I'm describing is bad news. But can I tell you some good news? If you're in Christ, you won't experience it. You'll be gone. You'll be gone. Your precious Savior loves you too much. He has promised, I will come and receive you unto myself so that you may be where I am. And then I've got some more good news. The story doesn't end here. At the battle of Armageddon, the Antichrist will rally the remaining troops to fight against the Lord Jesus Christ with his army. Revelation 19, the Antichrist and his armies are going to suffer total cataclysmic defeat at the hand of the mighty king. And Jesus, our Savior, yes, that baby in the manger will become the mighty king of the skies, and he won't even need to lift a finger. (laughs) Revelation 19 and verse 15 says, the sword of his word will smite the nations. Daniel 8, the prophet says, the Antichrist will be destroyed and not by human power. Satan will be chained. Jesus Christ will return to the earth as King of kings and Lord of lords to judge his enemies. He will once and for all end Satan's deception. He will set up his kingdom on this earth that will last for 1,000 years. You and I will reign with him and God will have his garden of Eden. Every promise that he has ever made will be fulfilled and completed in that 1,000 year reign. And that period will be marked by peace and prosperity. The faithful will be rewarded. The creation will be redeemed and every covenant 
made by God will be kept because he keeps every promise. And at the end of the thousand years, Satan, because he is such a fool, will once again try again to undo the work of the Almighty God, but he will be defeated and he will be cast into an eternal fire that was created for the devil and his angels and there will be absolute peace. And you and I will begin to enjoy the world for which we were created, eternal living in the presence of God forever. Amen. So Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. What's next? Victory is what's next. What's next? Peace is what's next. What's next? Joy is what's next. There will be peace on earth for the child of God, dear friend. For the child of God, there is no reason to fear the future. There is no reason to fear the future. You can have security about the victory. Do we not need this message today? Do we not need this message today? Boy, the world is upside down. We are in a season of much know-how and hardly any know-why. We're in a generation that knows how to take a computer and put it in a phone that will fit in your purse or pocket. But ask most people who develop that computer, why are we on this earth? And they give you a look with saucer wide eyes. Like, well, we can't know the answer to that. Consequently, when a pandemic hits, it spirals us out of control because we have placed our trust in governments and scientists. And we're being reminded that we can't save ourselves. Consequently, more people died of suicide last month in Japan than COVID. Consequently, suicide rates, anxiety rates, rates of depression are spiking. Consequently, calls to emotional help hotlines are up over a thousand percent this month from what they were this time last year. Because we're freaking out. We need some good news. We've been circling over Australia too long. <laughs> Somebody needs to tell us what's next. Christmas tells us what's next. And to you, dear church, to you, dear child of God, I'm begging you. I implore you. Don't give up. Don't cave in. Don't throw in the towel. Don't walk away. We need people with their eyes looking toward heaven saying, perhaps today we need a quorum of people like you who will live with knees bent, hearts soft, Bible open and ears listening. We need people. We need people to do what Gateway's doing right now. And that is getting the good news out to as many people as possible because we see the clock is ticking and the time is drawing near. We need people to be like that congregation in London. No one would have faulted them had they not gathered on that Sunday morning. The night before, the airplanes had bombed the city on Hitler's demand, rendering London into a circle of fire. Air raids had crushed the structures. Buildings were collapsed. Bricks were on the streets, including the building in which that church met. And when those stalwart saints showed up that Sunday morning to worship, the roof was gone from their church. The walls were down and bricks covered the pews. They had no place to sit, but that didn't stop them from worshiping. 
They stood in a circle of their collapsed building and they sang this old hymn. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by spirit and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Can you envision that circle of brave souls? They set their faith on our unfailing God and smack in the middle of a global crisis, even worse than the one we're facing today. They gathered, they circled, and they worshiped the explosions, the sirens, the sounds all night long, yet they gathered to worship. We know this because of a young reporter by the name of Ben Patterson, an American war correspondent who had arrived from the United States, believe it or not, the day before his first night in a hotel in London. He covered his head with a pillow, and he later said he cried out for God to take his life from him because all he could hear were the sirens and the screams of the dying and the wounded he despaired of life itself. At some point, he dozed off. He awoke to the unexpected sound of a singing church. He looked outside the window and he saw this congregation gathered in the rubble. He later wrote, Suddenly I saw something in the world that was untouchable something that had endured through the millennia, something that was indestructible, the spirit and life and power of Jesus within his church. Friends, bombs are still dropped. Worlds still explode. Pandemics still rage. But in the midst of it all, in the midst of it all, God has his people. God has you. And you, and you, and you, and you. And your society needs you. Your family needs you. Your school needs you. Your business needs you. The world is clamoring right now for some people who aren't giving up. Some people who are willing to climb out of bed each morning and say, okay, I'm trusting in the goodness of an almighty God and I'm not going to throw in the towel. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm not taking any shortcut. You can count on me. I was here. I'm here for this moment for such a time as this. God has called me to be here. Will you be one of those people? Will you? Will you? Will you? Will you? Tis the season to be looking. Not for a jolly man in a red suit, but for a grand king on a white horse. And at his command, the sea will give up their dead. The devil will give up his quest. The kings and queens will give up their crowns. Broken hearts will give up their despair. And God's children will give up their worship. Wise is the saint who searches like Simeon. Amen. Amen. We bless you, Lord. We bless you for your promised return. And we set our hearts to it today. Have mercy, please, O Lord, upon all those within earshot of these words. Let your sweet spirit, yes, the same spirit who led Simeon, lead us. And grant that we can have the faith that will find the baby Jesus in the manger and we will see the coming Jesus in the future. Through Christ we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Would you stand with us please as we again thank Pastor Max Lucado. Would you give him another round of applause? And I want to invite you right now, whether you're here with us in person or you're at home, to turn your attention to the Lord again. And I want to ask you if you have any need for prayer. A a message like that makes you reflect on your own foundation. Maybe there are bombs falling in your world right now. Maybe you feel the 
the wind of the enemy coming against you and you need prayer today, I just want you to close your eyes for just a moment. And if you'll just let me know that you need prayer, just raise your hand. I'm not gonna do anything to embarrass you. We're just gonna pray over you. Just lift up your hand. Just say, yeah, I need prayer today. There's something going on in my life. I wanna pray over you. Just keep your eyes closed for a moment. I wanna let you know at the end of the service, you noticed folks coming up front here with tables. We've got some, you know, it appropriately distance. If you want prayer with someone in person at the end of the service, I'll invite you to come back down. Or if you're in the lobby, or if you're in the uh, second balcony, there's just tables outside the door. But right now, I wanna pray for you if you have any prayer need. God, I thank you for those who have lifted up their hands. Lord, maybe even those who haven't lifted their hands, but in their hearts say, yeah, I've, I've got a lot of issues. I need prayer right now. Maybe someone watching at home today is saying, God, I need you to meet me right now, exactly where I am. You know, Lord, the bombs that are falling in my life. God, we turn our attention to you and say, it's only by your grace and mercy, Lord Jesus, that we can get through this situation, that we can take the next step. God, would you meet us today? Lord, make your presence known. Emmanuel, be God with us. In this season right now, let us see the miraculous work of your hand, your touch in our lives. And I pray that the testimonies will come from this moment in time, from this time right now, where our hearts are surrendered to you. And we're asking you, God, to move on our behalf, move in our situations. God, do it, I pray. And let us hear the testimonies of your working in our lives. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you need prayer and you want someone to respond to you, you're not able to come in person, you can always text that prayer to 71010. We want to be able to reach out to you. Okay, and I know you enjoyed this message from Pastor Max Lucado. We have books available that he's written in all of the campus bookstores. There's You Are Never Alone and Because of Bethlehem are his newest books, so you'll want to get those. If you are watching and joining us online, you can text STORE to 71010 and you can also purchase those. I want to remind you what Pastor Robert mentioned about the changing times of the candlelight service next weekend. You can go on Gateway gatewaychristmas.com to find all of those times. Like for instance, the four o'clock Saturday service will now be a three o'clock service. So you'll definitely want to go and see about those changes. Also, if you go online, you can see some uh, fun little things that we do. If you're gonna be having the candlelight service in your home, there's activities that can make it feel really real to you and you'll wanna find those as well. I know that we got to orient our hearts today to the promise of Jesus. And as you leave, would you carry that promise with you into your week. Go be blessed and know that we love you. See you next week.